Good afternoon. Let me start by saying again that we pray for all the victims of the Key Bridge collapse and also all their families. The six people who died when the Key Bridge fell are not just names on a paper. They were Marylanders. Their lives had meaning. Their work had dignity. And we think about them every single day. Ellos eran Marylanders. Sus vidas tenían sentido. Sus trabajos tenían dignidad. Y pensamos en ellos todos los días. Also, we'd like to recognize our first responders and all the emergency personnel. We could not do this work without them, and we are so grateful. The people who are searching the water right now, the people who are surveying the steel, the people who are laying down the plans, many of whom have not had chances to spend time with their friends and families in weeks, we say from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. And also, I'd like to give an acknowledgement to the sign language interpreters and those who have been with us every single press conference for these past three plus weeks. To all of you, we just want to say thank you. Now today, we will give updates on the directives that I've issued to the team. And as a reminder, they are first, we need to give closure and comfort to these families. Second, we need to clear the channel and open the vessel traffic to the port. Third, we need to take care of all of the people who have been affected by this crisis. And fourth, we need to and we will rebuild the key bridge. Now I'll focus most of my remarks today on the fourth and final directive of rebuilding the bridge. But before that, I do want to share a few quick updates. First, on bringing closure to the families, we are continuing to work with leaders all across the state to support these families in their time of need. And we are asking everyone to continue to respect the request of the families for privacy during this difficult time. Let's please not lose sight of ours or their humanity. The second, on opening the channel. As of this morning, we've lifted over 120 containers off of the dolly. And our goal is to remove 140 containers off of the dolly. So again, we continue to be uh, just not just impressed, but thankful for the work that has happened with Unified Command of getting the containers off of the dolly. Now, removing the containers is going to help us to build a staging area to access the pieces of the bridge that are on top of the dolly. Because if you look at the slide that we're going to present here, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. So as you see here, this is, a, uh, this is a, an the, the image that we have of the dolly with the ship sitting on top of it. And just as, a, just as a reminder, what we have here when we're talking about the enormity of the ship, every single one of these containers, when they are empty, they are about one and a half to two and a half tons. Every single one of these containers that you see. On the dolly, there are 4,000 of them. That is the size of this vessel, understanding the enormity of this ship. When we're talking about the, the key bridge that's sitting here, this piece of the bridge, the amount of weight that is sitting on, this, sitting on the vessel, that is three to 4,000 tons of steel that is sitting on top of this ship. The remainder of the key bridge, as we all know, is then sitting inside of the Pat Patapsco River, but three to 4,000 tons of steel is now sitting on the top of this bridge. Part of the operation that Unified Command is leading on now is the removal of some, not all, but some of the containers so we can then go through the process of removing the truss from the bridge so then you can begin the process of the refloat of the, of the, of the vessel and actually remove it from the channel. If we go to the next slide, this, this image is breathtaking because this is an aerial, an aerial, aerial footage of what we're talking about. You see here that it's almost difficult to assess what's what. And that's what it looks like from up top. This over here is a piece of 
the key bridge that we mentioned before, up, upwards of the three to 4,000 tons. This is the road. That is literally the road from the key bridge that's now sitting on top of the ship. What you have here, you see the vessels that I spoke about, and again, uh, the size, the weight of each and every one of these containers is staggering. You consider the fact that there are 4,000 of them. And this over here, you see, this is the bow. This is the front part of the ship, just to give a sense of context of where it is and what it all looks like. But from up top, you can see just the large, the level of complexity of this organization. And the fact that we have over 80 assets that are inside the water, whether they be boats, tugs, et cetera, cranes that are working, and over 380 people that are working around the clock under unified command. So these images, I think, give a clear sense of the measure of complexity and of the enormity of the task that we have at hand. So with that and seeing that, I also want to emphasize that we have now successfully removed around 1,300 tons of steel from the water. The thing I also want to say about that is this, 1,300 tons of steel, countless operations, and still not a single injury. When we started this operation, you know, we said clearly that we lost four Marylanders. We're not losing anymore. And the work that Unified Command has done to make sure that we are moving efficiently, moving quickly, and moving safely has been astounding. You all have made sure with your work that this was not just about making sure that we're taking care of the individuals and the families but also making sure that there was clear taking care of the people who are doing this work and doing the work on the ground. So I just want to say thank you for all the work you all continue to do on this. Now, on supporting those who have been affected by this crisis. On Tuesday, I discussed the launch of our new worker retention program to help companies avoid layoffs in the wake of the collapse. And in just one week, 58 businesses have received approval for the program. We've approved $4.54 million in assistance, which will protect the jobs of 824 Marylanders. And by the way, almost half of the awardees are minority business enterprises. So I want to take a moment to thank Secretary Portia Wu and her team at the Department of Labor for their leadership. This is not just quick, but it is remarkably efficient work that you all have led on. So thank you so much, Madam Secretary. And today, our administration is proud to be rolling out another program to support individual Marylanders. It is called the Port of Baltimore Worker Support Program, and it will be administered also through the Maryland Department of Labor. This new program will provide $430 in weekly relief to port workers who have lost pay and work hours due to the Key Bridge collapse. Our mission is to help as many people as we can during this difficult time, including port workers who have already applied for unemployment insurance benefits, including port workers who are receiving unemployment insurance, and including independent contractors and self-employed workers who are at the port and losing income because of the collapse. So to apply for this relief, please visit labor.maryland.gov slash port worker support. I'll say that one more time. Please visit labor.maryland.gov slash port worker support. And look, we promised at the start of this crisis that we wouldn't just be communicative, but that we would be over communicative. We said that we would make sure that people stayed updated. We said that we would make sure that people knew where to get their benefits. We said we will make sure that the community understands all of the next steps. And our commitment to that approach has not wavered one bit. 
and it's why we launched a website that provides all of those updates for federal, state, and local supports, and more. So please visit response.maryland.gov bridge to stay updated on our progress. Again, that is response.maryland.gov bridge so you can stay fully updated. Now, fourth, on rebuilding the key bridge. As I said on Tuesday, this is not about nostalgia. This is about necessity. You cannot have a fully functioning port of Baltimore if the key bridge is not there. 39,000 vehicles traveled over the key bridge every single weekday before it collapsed. And by the way, when I mentioned that number of 39,000, we're not just talking about commuters. We're talking about longshoremen who take the bridge to work. We're talking about the truckers who haul cargo to and from the port. In 2020, $21.5 billion in commercial freight moved across the Francis Scott Key Bridge, and that is not just commerce for Maryland. That is commerce for every single part of this country. The Key Bridge is one of the central links along the I-95 corridor. If you want to move a shipment from Philadelphia to Petersburg, you probably depend on the Key Bridge. If you want to move your products from Washington to Wilmington, you probably depend on the Key Bridge. We're not just talking about a Baltimore monument. We're talking about a gateway from the north to the south for small businesses and for corporations. And that's essentially true, essentially, especially true if your company is, trans, is transporting hazardous materials. Because hazmat trucks along I-695 include everything from fuel to lithium batteries to cleaning supplies. These trucks are not allowed in tunnels. The key bridge was one of the only ways that they could move along the I-95 corridor. So now, each and every one of those hazmat trucks are now being forced to take alternative routes. So for example, we know that some trucks that are carrying fuel, the fuel trucks that we all rely on, their commutes now are almost an hour longer. And many of these hazmat trucks, by the way, are owner-operated small businesses. People that we know, that time distance is a very real problem. These economic consequences of the bridge collapse are staggering, and I'm not the only one who thinks this. To my left, we are joined by leaders in business, in union, in nonprofits. These leaders in all these industries, they represent over a dozen different industries. They represent over 35,000 Maryland employees. And all of them, all of them agree that rebuilding the key bridge is not just a local priority. Rebuilding the key bridge is an economic imperative. Many of the leaders here belong to our Maryland Tough, Baltimore Strong Alliance. The folks who have raised their hand to continue to build support for Maryland's recovery. The people who you see here have been on the front lines of Maryland's economic strength for years, and today all of them are saying with one collective voice, we need to work together to reopen the port, and we need to work together to rebuild this bridge. And I couldn't be prouder of our state's response in this moment. And I couldn't be prouder of this team. And I want to say to all of our leaders in the private sector, in the public sector, in governments, nonprofits, to each of you, I want to say thank you for showing what it means to be Maryland tough and Baltimore strong. Thank you. So we've laid out the four directives for our recovery. But I do want to be clear, we cannot win this moment without addressing every single one of them. We are going to bring closure and comfort to these families. We are going to clear this channel. We are going to support everyone who's been affected by this crisis. And we are going to rebuild the Francis Scott Key Bridge. 
I know we are going to get this moment right because we're choosing to work together. I was back on Capitol Hill yesterday meeting with leaders of both parties to talk about the path forward. And I personally want to thank Chairman Cole, Chairman Graves, and Chairman Womack for meeting with me and sharing their commitment to rebuilding the bridge quickly. These are representatives of Oklahoma and Arkansas and Missouri, and all of them understood the importance of the Key Bridge. You know, in fact, when I met with Chairman Cole, he told me that he was Secretary of State of Oklahoma during the Oklahoma City bombing. And he was talking about the response that they had in Oklahoma and how he was proud of the fact that everybody understood around the country that what happened that day was not an attack on Oklahoma. It was not an attack on Oklahoma City. It was an attack on our American fabric. It was a larger attack on democracy. And I want to thank Chairman Cole for also expressing his belief that what happened over three weeks ago and watching the Key Bridge collapse was not just about Maryland. That was a strike to our nation's economy. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to be able to work side by side with people of both sides of the aisle and frankly from around the country who understand that this recovery is an imperative for all of us. So to everyone who's here in Dundalk, everyone here in the city of Baltimore, and everyone across the state, I want you all to hear me loud and clear. We are going to rebuild this bridge and we're going to do it together. So in a few moments, I want to turn the program over to Mark Anthony Thomas. Mark is the CEO of the Greater Baltimore Committee. He's a personal friend and a frat brother, and he's doing remarkable work. And I'm so grateful to have his support today and every single day. And we're also going to be joined by the following speakers. Rear Admiral, Rear, Rear Admiral Watson, representing Unified Command, Baltimore City Mayor Brandon Scott, Baltimore County Executive Johnny Olszewski, and all of our partners who are here today, we just want to say thank you for continuing to lead. So now, I'll turn it over to the CEO of the Greater Baltimore Committee, Mark Anthony Thomas. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. The collapse of the Key Bridge shocked the world. While the short-term and long-term impacts of our economy are still being assessed, we do know one thing for sure. The Port of Baltimore and related industries are critical to Baltimore, to Maryland, and to the nation. And the Key Bridge itself is a foundation for the success of our regional economy's global competitiveness. As the governor mentioned, I serve as the CEO of the Greater Baltimore Committee. In addition to our partnership to support the Maryland Tough Baltimore Strong Alliance, which raised more than $15 million from the private sector to support communities in the recovery, and include many of the partners to my left, I represent more than 400 of America's most influential companies and philanthropic organizations, and some of our state's most ambitious entrepreneurs and innovative academic institutions. Yet, there's one thing that unifies us. We all care about Baltimore's people, its neighborhoods, its businesses, and we work collectively to ensure the region contributes to America's dynamic economy. The export industry is one of those pillars of good jobs in American entrepreneurship. In Baltimore, our transportation and industrial economy are as important to the global supply chain as the universities and R&D hubs are to fostering American technology and health innovation that shape this world. Businesses large and small all depend on the infrastructure and talent that ensure the world's supply chains work seamlessly, and we can't emphasize enough how important the key bridge is as a significant infrastructure investment for the United States of America. More than 11 million vehicles passed over the bridge in the last year, and this includes 1.3 million truck trips. 
It is a local transit asset for more than 20,000 workers at nearby Trade Point Atlantic and serves as a major transportation thoroughfare for the nation's most densely populated metropolitan regions. With the loss of the bridge, we're already feeling that impact. The key bridge connects multiple counties and communities and serves as an industrial bypass that connects us to the nation and to the global economy. It serves as a backbone for Americans' emerging industries in the industrial and manufacturing sectors. And for Baltimore and our region, the port is more than just history. It is a major economic bet that we're leaning into for our future, and we need to rebuild the key bridge to deliver the economic development opportunity for America. Major private investment and public support will expand the capacity along the water and the railways, creating thousands of jobs, new business opportunity, with the impact supporting business activity on the entire eastern seaboard and industrial routes from here to America's heartland. This is why the Greater Baltimore Committee stands with Governor Moore and our partners in the public sector to support the full federal support for the rebuilding of the Key Bridge. The commitment from the federal government will enable us to continue to aggressively pursue our region's ambitions and ensure that the Baltimore port and transportation industry leverages our unique assets to contribute to the growth of the global export economy. And so I couldn't be more proud to be here to support this effort. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, Governor. Good afternoon, all. Uh, I want to first, be to first begin by again extending uh, our heartfelt sympathies uh, and condolences to all the families, friends, loved ones, and all impacted uh, by this tragic incident. The Unified Command uh, continues to make great progress, uh, restoring navigation, restoring commerce in this great port. To that end, we shared with you all earlier uh, this week that um, we had removed two of the larger submerged sections uh, from the waterway. And I'm proud to share uh, that we are actively removing yet another large section from the waterway. I believe we're rigging it up right now. Uh, so we're excited about this work. This is great news as it keeps us on track uh, to open the limited access channel by the end of this month. With respect to removing the ship, uh, we continue to remove containers and debris uh, from the bow of the ship uh, to allow us access uh, to finally safely remove uh, the bridge segment from the bow that's lodged against the bow uh, and to subsequently refloat the ship. Uh, with respect to our work to remove debris otherwise uh, from the waterway, uh, we are committed to that work and the state has been instrumental in aggressively going about this work. The key takeaway is, is that we continue to make great progress. Uh, and we are proud of our effort. We're proud of the teamwork uh, of this unified command team. Uh, and we thank you all for your continued support as we do this critical work uh, to restore navigation, uh, to restore commerce in this great port. We thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you, Governor. And thank you all for being here uh, this afternoon. Every time uh, we gather like this, it reinforces uh, the collaboration and coordination that is happening uh, behind the scenes every day and every moment and continuing to happen right now while we're speaking with you. From the Federal Railroad with the Unified Command, the Coast Guard, Army Corps engineers, congressional delegation who are fighting tooth and nail to ensure that this uh, remains a priority in Congress and for the nation. Despite all the uncertainty that we've heard about funding, we know that they're going to do that work. And we know, Mr. Governor, that alongside you, they're going to bring this home for not just Baltimore, not just Maryland, but these United States of America. But even down to the county executive and myself, we are all working together each and every moment to meet not only the moment, but the goals that have been set to reopen the channels by the end uh, of this month, the next month, uh, the larger channel, and to deliver 
badly needed support to the families who lost loved ones and those port workers who uh, remain uh, and continue to face the brunt of this tragedy. We cannot uh, forget uh, a true and hurting fact. There are still two Marylanders lost and still waiting to be returned with their families for closure. We won't lose sight of that, and we will not rest until we bring them home. And I know that everyone here shares that feeling deep in their heart. As we approach uh, the fourth week of this effort, for many families impacted and more, more and more bills continue to come. I want to, to reiterate that for Baltimore City residents and to addition to the great work that the governor and team have laid out today, city government is here to help in any way that we can. We have utility bill, water bill, and rental assistance available for those directly impacted by the closure of the port. Applications for the wage subsidy program for impacted businesses remain open and we're looking for ways to expand that investment. And in partnership with the state, we're continuing to support the Maryland Tough Baltimore Strong Fund. I know there are many, many, many additional services uh, from the small businesses, from the federal government, down to things at the local level. Please make sure that you visit the website and take advantage of every single one of them. That commitment uh, will stand now and for as long as we have to be there for our businesses, for our people, for those families, as we rebuild to be a better city, a stronger city, a stronger state, and will make this country even stronger. And that will continue in the way that we have done since the very first moments of this tragedy, in total collaboration, collaboration with each other. Thank you very much. And with that, we'll go from the point guard to the center. I'll turn it over to County Executive Johnny Osheski. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor, and uh, good afternoon, all. It is uh, an honor to continue to stand alongside such distinguished leaders uh, with you, Governor, Lieutenant Governor, the entire unified command team, with you, Mayor Scott, um, Mr. Thomas, and the entire business community today. Um, this, is, this is what sustained partnership looks like. It's what we're going to have to keep doing in the days, weeks, and months ahead to meet the goals outlined by Governor Moore. And I just want to say this has been the most collaborative effort I have ever seen uh, in all of my time as county executive and through all of my experience in government. And we're seeing the difference it makes. So to all of the partners in this work, please accept my heartfelt thanks, even as we also continue to pray for the families who lost loved ones as we continue to thank our first responders and those conducting the salvage operations, and even as we work with amazing leaders like Secretary Wu to provide even additional resources to those who are impacted. Uh, as Mayor Scott said, we in local government fill the gaps, and we're prepared to continue to help amplify the message of our governor uh, and of our agencies and state government of what's available to our impacted businesses, to our impacted individuals. We will continue to be here, continue to collaborate, and continue to meet the need. As I've said before, this is a community that was literally forged out of steel. And that same steel resolve will help us meet this moment, reopen our port, and rebuild the Key Bridge. I wanna thank the governor for his work in Washington with our amazing federal delegation. Uh, for earlier this week, convening local leaders, um, a former governor, who again, amplified that message. This is not, this is not partisan, this is patriotic. This is for our country, and this is for the greater good. So again, to our partners, thank you. Governor, thank you for your leadership. And again, it is an honor to stand alongside you as we continue this work. I understand what you mean. Thank you. Has there been any, sorry? More momentum in getting additional federal support for rebuilding? Yeah, so um, we've been incredibly encouraged by the conversations that we have had uh, with, uh, with members, of, uh, members of Congress, both in the House and the Senate, and uh, members of, of Congress, both Republican and Democrat. You know, just yesterday, uh, we were with, uh, you know, Chairman Cole and Chairman Womack uh, and Chairman Graves, all Republicans. Uh, and so the, the, the type of encouragement that we have received about people understanding the, the national urgency of getting this done, that we want to move with a measure of speed, uh, that we have to be able to make sure that all four of the objectives that we 
laid out are accomplished. Uh, I'm, we've been encouraged that there has been a, a real level of momentum on Capitol Hill for that, and the Biden administration have just been absolutely remarkable partners, uh, literally from the very first day and throughout. So we're, uh, we're, we're encouraged, but we also know that, uh, that the work will continue. Uh, Governor, where do you stand on uh, efforts to have the bridge possibly renamed after Congressman uh, Perrin Mitchell? Uh, do you favor that? Are you open to that? Or would you prefer that it remain the Francis Scott Key Bridge? I, I understand that these are important questions. I also know that, uh, that we are locked in on the four objectives that we've laid out, that, uh, that we have to bring comfort uh, and, uh, and closure to these families. We have got to get these channels reopened, that we've got to make sure that we are supporting those who have been affected uh, by this crisis, uh, and to include family members and port workers. Uh, and we've got to get this bridge uh, rebuilt. So I know any other conversations, uh, all those things are, even if they are important conversations, they are not now conversations. But our focus is on making sure that we accomplish the four objectives first. Yes, this uh, question for maybe Rear Admiral Watson or uh, uh, Colonel Prochason. Uh, I have a question about once the uh, bridge is removed from the uh, dolly, would you guys be backing it straight back or will it be moved to the uh, larger channel before you, to, uh, before you move it? And, and another quick question, how many pieces will you have to break down that bridge to remove it from the ship? Okay, so just to make sure I understand, you're asking how many pieces are gonna, is it going to require to remove the span that's on top of the dolly, and what's going to happen to the dolly when we, when we remove it? So the first thing that we're focused on is opening the temporary limited access channel. And right now we're removing the wreckage that's wrapped around the pillar that's across from the dolly. It's really important to get relief to the port first. At the same time, while all this is going on, there's a tremendous amount of planning and engineering that's taking place to work on how we're going to remove that massive span that's on top, laying across, and on the side of the dolly. You've also got wreckage that's on the other side as well. Uh, and we have to do this very safely. So the, the um, coordinated demolition, the controlled demolition of that span is being planned right now. And it's, it's, gonna have, it's gonna require significant cutting because it's such a large, large span. Uh, but once, the, once that wreckage is removed from the dolly, we're gonna go through a refloating sequence that's very intricate, uh, but that's all in planning right now as well. And the vessel is gonna be returned to a location in the port of Baltimore where it'll be assessed for final disposition by the shipper. Thank you. Governor, um, so we heard last week from the attorneys for some of the victims' families and one of the survivors that the survivor said he did not get, and then any of the construction crew did not get any verbal warning or any type of warning. I know in the days after the collapse, Secretary Wiedefield and you both talked about, you were asked about early warning systems and whether that might be a thing to consider in any future bridges and also currently existing bridges. Can we get an update on that? Is that something that you think is feasible? Yeah, I, I know that... Um well, there's, there is an active investigation that's going on right now as to what happened in, uh, immediately as, we were, as the ship was, was coming in and also in the moments uh, directly after. And I know that, that, um, that there are thorough investigations, and we want those investigations to be speedy and thorough, and we'll have a better understanding of what exactly happened. Uh, we also know that safety is paramount. And so everything that we are talking about when it comes to the rebuilding of the bridge, anything that when it comes to how we're going to and how we need to fortify all elements of critical infrastructure in the state of Maryland, uh, the number one gating criteria has got to be safety. And so I think any options that are going to make sure that the people of this state are safe are options that we are going to, that we are going to consider and look to implement. Hi. Um, I know that there are some organizations locally that are helping crews of the Dolly and other uh, crews that are on the cargo ship still stuck in the port. Is there any support from state or even federal support that you're looking to create uh, that specifically helps them or um, anything like that? Uh, specifically ones who are still on 
The dolly? Yeah, the dolly and the other uh, cargo ships that are still stuck in the port. Yes, yeah, so, so we, we have been in consistent communication uh, with, uh, with the folks who were, who were there uh, and know that they are in, uh, in, in good health and good condition. Uh, we also know that we're going to stay in consistent communication with them and anyone else uh, who is within the channel uh, in the moment. As far as getting the piece of the bridge that's on the dolly off, I know you said that that was being staged and planned right now. What is the timeline for that? When do you expect to get that bridge piece off and how long should it take? Okay, so I just wanna make sure we're, we're clarifying. So the, the parts of the wreckage that are being rigged right now are across from the vessel. They're wrapped around the pier. So I know the last few weeks we were talking about the large span that was, again, across from the vessel. But if you look at the, if you look at the, uh, I don't know if we have a picture of it, but if you look at the pier that's still intact, not the pier that the vessel took out, that's embedded inside the, inside the vessel. Uh, we might have a picture or two, and if we do, we can head on over. Do we have, I don't know if we have any other pictures. Across from the vessel, if you, we all picture, we're, let's pretend we're standing and looking at the city of Baltimore. You've got the vessel to your right, to your left, and you've got a, a standing pier all the way on the far side, across from the vessel. There is some wreckage that wasn't one of those spans that goes straight into the water. It's hanging out and around, and we want to make sure that that's removed. We got direct feedback from our Maryland pilots who conducted a ship simulation of this limited access channel down in Vicksburg, Mississippi, with the Engineer Research and Development Command. They created a model for our pilots to be able to run through and identify any of their needs uh, to help mark and uh, provide instructions for how to navigate this limited access channel. And that wreckage is being removed right now. It's gonna be removed in uh, three pieces, two very large ones and one smaller one over the next coming days. So we're very excited about that. Um, the wreckage on the vessel itself is in the planning phases as well, and we're looking for that to be coming up in the, in the coming weeks as we continue to solidify the plan and coordinate that across all three salvers. If, if you look at the picture that the governor shows, you have all three salvage efforts coalescing right at that location. You've got our contractor that's working in the channel, the vessel salver, and also the state. All three need to be coordinated so that we keep safety at, at the top, top priority, safety of the vessel, safety of the workers, and, and it's, it's going very well. Just looking forward to next week. It'll be four months on Tuesday. Um, four weeks. Four, God, not four months. Um, four weeks. So, is there anything? What have you learned most from this experience? And is there anything you might have done differently in in hindsight now over the last month? I'm still heartbroken that we still have two unaccounted for souls. I um. I just can't stop thinking about the pain these families are feeling. Um, the news they got almost four weeks ago is um, the most heartbreaking news. And, um, and these leaders here have been working around the clock. This has been a 24-7 operation that has taken place ever since the Dolly first ran into the Francis Scott Key Bridge. People have been working around the clock on this and have done it with a remarkable professionalism and humanity. Um, I could not be more thankful and impressed by this state's response, where we've watched an entire state rally around a community, around families, around workers, around leadership. I am so proud to be a Marylander. I am so proud to be the state's governor. 
And frankly, after continuing to look at the work of Unified Command, I'm so proud to be an American. Um, and so there have been a lot of lessons learned. There have been um, continuing to be truly heartbreaking moments. There have been moments that I know for all of us, our chests have just been swelled with pride in watching how remarkable this team and this response has been, how coordinated the local leadership and the mayor, the county executive, all the teams. Um, but the thing I just, I, I cannot and will never shake is um, we still got two souls who are unaccounted for. And, um, and we will never, ever, uh, and their families will never lose, leave, uh, leave our thoughts and our prayers. Thank you all. Thanks, guys.